Okay, well, hello everyone and welcome to the end of day one in terms of talks. Uh, congrats, you made it here. Uh, and we've had some really great talks today already. Uh, you know, listening to the PowerShell team and their feedback there and all the great stuff they're releasing and listening to Jeffrey Snover himself. I know I enjoyed that talk from April Edwards as well. Um, and so hopefully you've also had a chance to catch up with some old friends. I know I have for sure. And uh, hopefully you get to make some new ones too. Uh, so I'm your last talk today. Uh, and I promise I won't hold you up too long from the evening's festivities, but um, I just want to say I'm just so happy to be back here in person at PowerShell Summit. You know, uh, the PowerShell community, a lot of folks that I know here know, uh, have been such a big contributor in helping us level up our tech careers. And uh, so I hope it does that for you too. And uh, we're generally pretty friendly, you know, come and reach out. Uh, how many of you folks, just by a show of hands, is this your first summit? Okay, awesome. See, so there's so many folks here who are just like new to PowerShell Summit as a whole. So feel free to reach out if you know any folks that have been here before. You know, talk to us, come reach out to us. We're friendly. We don't bite because uh, we can't afford the legal costs if we do. Um, yeah, so generally I'd say just, you know, it is what you make. Whatever you put in is what you get out of it. So, you know, feel free to reach out. Get out of your comfort zone a little bit. I'll try and make myself available. Come and harass me at any point during Summit. Okay, so my talk is called, Is It Down Again? Uh, so PowerShell Gallery Outage Mitigation Strategies. I know that's a mouthful. The original title of this talk was, this is fine, uh, but I didn't want to end up going with that. It, I thought it was funny, but um, sort of what I'm trying to explain is, I just, uh, you know, different ways that you can approach the problem, so to speak. So let's get into it a little bit. So firstly, let's run you through the agenda just so you know what you're getting yourself into today. Um, I will introduce myself first and PowerShell Gallery, just in general. Uh, and then I want to dive into NuGet feeds specifically and uh, the different flavors of NuGet. Because uh, I feel like, as a community, uh, of a lot of talks that we give, we don't really address the underlying technology behind um, the PowerShell Gallery and NuGet repositories. So we just kind of do a lot of hand-waving around, yeah, it's NuGet under the hood, don't worry about it. But I feel like it's important context for you to have to frame the discussions. Um, so then I'll talk a little bit about concerns around reliance on the PowerShell Gallery exclusively. Um, and then also, of course, espouse the benefits of internal repositories, which is my solution to that, or my proposed solution. Uh, then I'll give you different options that you have when you're hosting your own internal PowerShell repository as an organization. Uh, and I will also, in my humble opinion, present the simplest approach that I believe is out there now. Uh, I will demo that as well. Uh, and uh, I will also highlight some projects that are out there in the PowerShell community that are helping to solve this problem too. Uh, and finally, I think I'm going to close with a little bit of a can we do better approach, just a proposed solution that I would love your feedback on at some point. So let's hop in. So who's this guy in front of you here? So I am Adil Ligari. It's Adil like Adil Pickle. Nice and easy to remember. Uh, I am a solution architect manager at CloudSmith. I am a sysadmin turned solution architect turned manager. I've spent about two decades wrangling endpoints and workstations and servers and Windows, Mac, Linux. Um, I've been an active member of the PowerShell DevOps community probably for about five years now. Um, and I'm just uh, super passionate about PowerShell DevOps and automation. And uh, also randomly, I am the resident PowerShell sticker artist. So there's a lot of stickers out there that I've designed. I, they will be available in the sticker swap room tomorrow and the day after. So feel free to reach out to me too and bug me in the halls if you want one of those. Uh, but more importantly for today's discussion, of course, I've also spent the last three and a half years uh, at, in the package management space. So here at CloudSmith now, but before previously at Chocolatey as well. So I guess you could say I know a thing or two about NuGet packages to steal a line from my friend Stevie. So let's get the warning out of the way first. Full disclosure, uh, I am going to be expressing opinions in my talk. They may sound biased towards certain solutions, but uh, my employer is not paying for my entrance to this event or in control of the opinions that I'll be expressing. Uh, last I checked, I am, though, gainfully employed by CloudSmith, and CloudSmith is a sponsor of PowerShell Summit 2022. Um, but this talk was accepted here, just like every other talk, and like my talk last year when I was at Chocolatey. Um, but the real point I'm trying to make is, having spent the past three and a half years in the package management community, what I've had the opportunity of is firsthand experience on a lot of repository solutions and providers. So um, the value I hope to impart to you today is sort of the benefit of my experience and opinion. So now that we have that out of the way, 
let's talk about the PowerShell gallery. Uh, so it is, we'll start with the basics. There's no gatekeeping here for all levels. Um, the community repository, of course, for PowerShell modules, DSC resources, and scripts. So the PowerShell gallery launched in preview in November 2014. Uh, it came out of, uh, it was open for public contributions around July 2015, and uh, it came out of preview in February 2016. It is, of course, hosted by Microsoft via Azure and CDNs, various CDNs, and it is under the purview of the wonderful PowerShell team, and uh, I believe the lead on the project right now is uh, the uh, incomparable Sydney Smith sitting in the back, so everybody wave. Uh, I feel like she deserves a round of applause for hosting this service, so let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> I've spent three years involved in, with Chocolatey, and I will tell you, maintaining a community repository in a public feed is no small feat. Just, you know, you worry about uptime all the time, and, you know, a lot of these services, you know, people come to rely on and, and where they're available for free, right? Um, so, yeah, um, obviously the PowerShell gallery under the hood uses the PowerShell get and package management modules on your end, on the uh, consumer end, uh, to, uh, you know, interact and integrate with the feed and to pull down modules from the PowerShell gallery. And so the underlying format uh, that the PowerShell gallery uses is NuGet version 2. So let's dive into NuGet a little bit and what it is. So what is NuGet? So NuGet is the official package management system for .NET development, right? This includes a platform and tooling to help .NET developers create, publish, consume, and share reusable code. So simply, the, the format in which this code is bundled is called a NuGet package, which is the smallest shareable unit of that code. So NuGet was created in 2010, I believe, as NuPack by the Outer Curve Foundation, a nonprofit funded by Microsoft. Um, Rob Reynolds from Chocolaty, uh, who was involved in the early days of the project, does mention that it was originally called New and You, uh, but that's not something you'll find on Wikipedia, so you'll have to check with him. Uh, but yeah, so it was founded by the Outer Curve Foundation, and so very much the logical successor to that has now has been the .NET Foundation. Uh, so NuGet packages, you know, what is in a NuGet package? So actually, like the simplicity of it is, the short answer is it's just a fancy zip file with the .NUPKG extension. But it does contain some specific things in it normally, and we'll highlight those here. So it contains compiled code in the form of libraries in some cases, so DLLs. This is often what you see in NuGet v3 packages for .NET C Sharp developers. So when they're consuming from NuGet.org, they normally have compiled code in there, and that is the libraries that you import into Visual Studio in order to, to, to utilize those functionality. In the case of um, some uh, different NuGet packages, NuGet v2 for Chocolatey, let's say, um, those are actually binaries that are contained in there, so EXEs or MSI, so the actual application installer itself um, that can be included. Uh, and other file related, so other related files can be added to that uh, NuGet package, and these related files often just, just describe how to use or install it. Uh, in the case of Chocolatey packages, these are just PowerShell scripts to install and install upgrade. And the last piece, of course, is the .new spec file. Um, and that's your manifest file, XML manifest, and it details the metadata about the package, so the version, title, author information, et cetera. Uh, now, PowerShell get package management in the back end. What they do is they actually convert your modules and your folder there into an actual NuGet package with this uh, with this nice manifest and all the other pieces in it. So NuGet, in the case of PowerShell, is just used as a delivery mechanism to push up uh, PowerShell modules and pull them down. When they're on your system, they're obviously not in the NuGet format anymore. So let's highlight a few communities here, specifically when we talk about NuGet. So NuGet has three different main communities around it um, that share the NuGet format. And so we'll touch on two of them briefly before getting to PowerShell. So the first community, and the largest one, um, is probably the .NET developer community, largely c -sharp. Uh The organization behind this is, of course, the .NET Foundation, NuGet.org, and Microsoft. Uh, the language of choice for most of these uh, packages is c -sharp, uh, with some f -sharp, and of course, we have some VB hanging in there. Uh, the tool of choice here is Visual Studio. So uh, the Integrated Development Environment, or IDE, offered by Microsoft for a lot of .NET devs. And also, of course, the NuGet CLI. So a lot of .NET devs that want to interact programmatically with NuGet to build 
you know, packages in their pipelines, they're often using NuGet CLI to do that. Uh, the public repository of choice here is the NuGet gallery, so NuGet.org, and this is the largest um, you know, NuGet package repository out there, I believe. Uh, it has a r almost 300,000 unique NuGet packages, so quite, quite a diverse ecosystem there. So of course, these are the ones where they have compiled code and DLLs included in those NuGet packages, and most importantly, this is actually in the NuGet v3 format. This is the only one of the three communities that has moved to NuGet v3 yet. There are plans for uh, other communities too, but right now, um, basically NuGet.org and .NET Foundation got to a point with NuGet where they wanted to be able to scale out the solution. And NuGet v2 as a format, the way that it's architected is not easy to be scalable, as we're learning now with a lot of things, right? Performance uh, stuff. So uh, generally, that's why they moved to v3. Now, those folks in the NuGet space, like some of the chocolatey folks in the room here, know to go from NuGet to v2 to v3 is a major re-architecting of the format. So there's no easy upgrade path. There's, it's a really heavy lift. So a lot of our other communities will get there to NuGet v3, but it's, it's no small feat, I can assure you. So second community I will touch on quickly is the chocolatey developer community. These folks are near and dear to my heart. I'm Choco fan for life. I used to work at Chocolatey. Um, and so Chocolatey was founded 11 years ago now, just, just celebrated their 11th birthday. Um, Rob Reynolds started the open source project 11 years ago. Um, and now obviously there's also a business offering. If you're looking for something like that, there's plenty of Chocolatey folks here you can talk to as well. So the language of choice here is the Chocolatey CLI, which is actually just Choco commands, Choco upgrade, install, uninstall. Uh, and that is just a modified PowerShell host. And of course, along with that PowerShell files for install and install upgrade. The tools of choice, Chocolatey CLI again, uh, and the Chocolatey GUI as well. So that's how you can also um, you know, allow your users to select um, what packages or what, what programs they want to install on their machine uh, silently and non-interactively via a GUI. So the public repository here is the one that I was involved with back in the day for three years, and that is the Chocolatey Community Repository. And uh, it has about 7,000 packages in it. And uh, I can tell you just uh, the uptime of that. These types of things are, are sort of a thankless and an, uh, no small feat sort of task that's constantly taking your effort. So it's, it's, it is hard to maintain that uptime for sure. So mainly these packages are, of course, co composed of those binaries, EXEs, MSIs, and then PowerShell scripts that show you how to install and install or upgrade that. And finally, of course, we land on our community here, the PowerShell developer community as users of NuGet. Uh, and of course, the, the organizations here are the folks in this room, the PowerShell community themselves, and DevOps Collective and Microsoft. Uh, the language of choice, self-explanatory. Uh, tools of choice, P Windows PowerShell, so 5.1 I'll include it on all Windows hosts. Uh, PowerShell 7, now po used to be PowerShell Core, also called PWSH, whatever you want to call it. And the IDE of choice here is um, VS Code, so Visual Studio Code, um, the um, sort of cross-platform IDE offered by Microsoft for free. Uh, it's very robust and, and has a PowerShell extension built into it. Most PowerShell devs use it, unless your name is Paula Kingsley. Uh, she's not in the room right now, but I'm sure she'll watch this back online and get a chuckle out of that. She's an ISC user through and through. Um, so the public repository here, of course, we're talking about today is a PowerShell gallery, and uh, you know what it's composed of because we talked about that. So let's get to the meat of talk here. Let's talk about um, concerns around reliance on the PowerShell gallery explicitly or exclusively. So we've all heard it, right? You, you're on Twitter and you see, you know, you've, you've recently like built a pipeline where you're pulling down modules dynamically from the gallery. And that one time that you need to run something that you're ready to like go from test to prod, suddenly the PowerShell gallery isn't available, right? Um, so I've, it, anecdotally it's happened to a lot of folks that I know, including myself. Uh, myself included, and then you'll see the Twitter posts online for all of that stuff. So um, there is a PowerShell gallery repository, I will mention, um, that has a status uh, markdown file that reports every time it goes down that's recorded and what they're doing to fix it when it comes up. If you can file issues against it, if you have challenges like where you're experiencing that outage, you can file an issue there, and that helps them to track it a little bit. So I'd encourage you to do that. Um, but um, the, uh, what I've seen more commonly is sort of performance issues around it, right? So the PowerShell gallery hosts, I believe, what is it, around 9,000 packages now, unique packages and, and many, many thousands of versions of it. So 
I mean, obviously, um, sometimes what'll happen is searching or indexing against that feed. If you're doing a fine module and you're doing some sort of you know, explicit um, filters to try and find specific ones, then you can notice that performance is slower. Even just installing large modules like DBA tools or PS framework can take a while. So there are two points I want to make here. The first one is, of course, you know, let's have a little perspective in this, uh, in this conversation because I think um, a lot of us in this room uh, for other organizations maintain web applications and services that have uptime, right? And so I know it can be aggravating when you're depending on something that goes down, but think about it from your own perspective, right? A little bit of soft, soft, soft skills talk like and Andrew was doing, but the idea behind it uh, really is talking about the fact that, you know, we maintain these web applications and services ourselves, and you know, you know how stressful it is when you're on call and you have to worry about the uptime or when that, something like that goes down, you have to troubleshoot that issue. And uh, it's really not helpful when you have a lot of folks screaming at you about, you know, to get it up. So I think uh, practicing a little bit of empathy and grace in those uh, scenarios is really helpful. Um, you know, I want to see a lot more uh, hashtag hug ups to the PowerShell team when the PowerShell gallery goes down. I think we can all agree that to have a healthy and safe community, that's something we should do more of. Um, but along those lines as well, the other point that I'd like to make is that, you know, the bigger reason why you're here is using a public or community feed uh, or an internal repository or a public repository in your production workflows. To paraphrase the Mandalorian, this is not the way, right? This is not what we need to be doing. You want to be using your own internal repositories because you gain a lot of benefits from keeping those modules internal to your organization. So let's talk about those. So of course, the first benefit is right on the bat, you know, your own private modules. So you have your ability to um, house your modules um, within your repository. So if you have, uh, you know, a lot of organizations that I've worked with, they've had to um, take a PowerShell module down and they add some custom functionality in it. They edit the functions because they don't like how the logging is. They want some custom logging for their organization or they want to change certain naming schemes or tags or functions or versions of those packages internally as an organization. Or the other uh, big thing I see a lot is a lot of organizations will have their own proprietary bespoke modules that they've written themselves. You know, um, They have an in-house specialist like Kevin Marquette who's developing all of their modules internally. So of course, then you know, for those folks, that's proprietary code in the organization and that's not really suitable to have on a public feed. So you have the benefit in an internal repo to host that. And then of course, when you control an internal repo, you control the existing tooling, like CI/CD tooling and authentication around that, that uh, repository a little bit further. The public repo is just a public repo. With an internal repo, you can add your own single sign-on or uh, you know, your own uh, access control to that, and you can get really granular with your access control. So if certain teams don't require certain modules, you don't need to make those available to them, right? This is where you can get really curated. So, Let's say, um, you know, in a talk that Kevin was giving in 2019, he mentioned that his team internally was using about 50 modules. So those modules, you know, if you keep those in-house, those are the only 50 modules that your devs would need to use at that time, especially in production workflows. If something's being deployed to prod, you want to make sure that that's vetted so you get, or you're able to curate that code. So further, from, further to that same point, now we talk about workflows, right? You have your own CI CD pipelines. You have Let's say you have dev staging and prod. You have the ability now to, with internal repositories, to create a dev repository, a staging, and a prod. So your dev repository, basically when you go, you can have a pipeline built out of there that runs pester testing to make sure that all your pester tests pass and are green. And if, it, if so, that package, that module or NuGet package can be promoted into the staging repository. Then that staging repository can further run security checks. You can have your own te security team come in, make sure that that code is safe by them, you know, do detonation testing or whatever they need to in that staging repository. And when they're ready, when they pass their approval, then you can promote that from your stage into your production workflow. So internal repos give you the benefit of being able to do that to control your pipelines. Of course, you potentially also can control the availability and performance then because you have, you know, you can throw more CPU or RAM at it if it's a local repository or you can you know, potentially ask your provider to spin up more nodes in different regions if you needed to be more available. Um, but like the point I made earlier with about 20, 30, 50 modules that you might need internally as a team, those are gonna be, an, as an internal repository, a lot faster to be able to index and search against that feed 
than 9,000 packages, right? It just makes sense. So it just improves your workflow, makes it more efficient, and you know, gives you some benefits of availability there. So this is just highlighting some of the differences between on-prem repositories and cloud repositories. I'll touch on this quickly. Um, you know, again, like I mentioned before, Kevin has a talk tomorrow on internal repos, so feel free to, I'm plugging Kevin a lot, but he's sitting right in front of me, so it's nice. So let's talk about it a little bit, just in terms of quick comparison. So on-prem repositories, they're cost-effective awfully, uh, often because, uh, awfully, sorry. Uh, they're cost, often cost-effective because it's a standard capital expenditure hit. You've already bought the hardware in your data center, so why not spin up the servers there? Um, whereas cloud repositories are an ongoing operational expenditure hit, but the good news is that's relatively predictable. Now, there's a lot of setup complexity. I know from my times at Chaco, um, setting up a Nexus repo or something like that, you really do need to worry about the database being up, uh, uh, an application being up, and a web server being up, and multiple different services playing with each other. So that can be a little bit more complex to set up with an on-prem approach. Uh, some tools make that easy. I think Chocolaty has a Nexus repository installer, which is pretty efficient. Um, but still more complexity in terms of setup generally as compared to cloud repositories, which should be advertised being relatively frictionless. Um, so uh, also um, on-prem repos can be more resource intensive. When I say resources, I mean specifically um, not only just resources in terms of hardware and CPU uh, and RAM, but uh, specifically like um, for, it's funny, because I, I need to qualify this a little bit. Obviously there's a cost implement there in terms of resources. But the bigger, the bigger thing for me is, at the end of the day, you and your organizations have a core mission. You have core apps and you have core services that you maintain. The more time that your devs and your DevOps folks focus on that core app, um, the better it is for your organization, the more you set up for success. If you're spending a lot of your time maintaining not your core app, but all the apps surrounding it that's help you support and write that, that's not a good look. That doesn't uh, translate very well into a tool to, to measure your success as an organization. So, um, you know, kind of, uh, again, with, this, with the other point here with maintenance, patching, hardware, software upgrades, um, similar thing, you know, let somebody else worry about that stuff, right? Like Jeffrey likes to say, Jeffrey Snover will mention that, you know, you want to you wanna build the stuff that furthers your mission, right, as an organization and buy everything else. Because that's not direct, that's only peripheral to your mission. So again, yeah, maintenance, of course, somebody else's problem with your own hardware. You, of course, have to spin it up. You have to uh, hardware refresh cycles, uh, you know, every five years, et cetera, and you have to patch it all the time and all that other stuff that comes with it. And then, of course, with that, it's not easily scalable, right? Now you have spun up one machine, one VM in one place. Now you have an, uh, an India dev team that you need to support. You're suddenly going to have to spin that up there, too, or you're going to have to contact your provider to help you spin something up on-prem there, um, whereas cloud services are advertised to be more scalable. So let's get into a couple of options here for you. Now, this is now by no means an exhaustive list, uh, but these are some repository pro providers that I've had the benefit of some experience around. Uh, when we talk about cloud native offerings in terms of software as a service, uh, there's Azure DevOps Artifacts, the big one out there, uh, and the CloudSmith, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, there's on-prem and hybrid cloud solutions like Sonatype Nexus, JFrog Artifactory, and Anito ProGet. And uh, then over here on the right, those are NuGet v3 offerings, not something that we can use in PowerShell just yet. So just want a show of hands in here for you folks out, out here. Um, how many of, is, are any of your organizations using any of these repositories internally? Um, how about let's see a show of hands for Sonatype Nexus. Okay, and uh, JFrog Artifactory. Okay, cool. Uh, Inito ProGet. All right, how about uh, Azure DevOps Artifacts? And how about CloudSmith? You'll get there, you'll get there, don't worry. Um, <laughs> so let, let's talk about it a little bit. So a couple of things I'll mention here. Um, again, just opinions based on experience. Uh, Azure DevOps Artifacts, three things to keep in mind there. Uh, I believe the standard sub for Azure DevOps um, gives you the ability to have five team members. If you want more, you will have to pay for those additional team members, but, but I mean, like, it depends on your subscription with Azure DevOps, of course. Um, uh, also, you have to remember that uh, by default, it is a NuGet v3 feed, so you will have to downgrade it to NuGet v2, basically change the URL a bit. And uh, the third thing to keep in mind is you do have a PAT token, so personal access token, and that token is one year max expiring, so don't forget 
after the year because your pipelines will suddenly stop working and you won't know why. So that's an important uh, three points to make there that I've sort of uh, learned from experience. Uh, in terms of uh, on-prem hybrid cloud offerings, I've worked with all these three solutions. I find a lot of them are generally um, on-prem solutions where you know, it started as a VM and uh, you know, it's sort of a lift and shift. So there's a lot of like building um, something that was on-prem and then you suddenly just spin it up in the cloud. So it's essentially a VM in the cloud. So sort of it gets into the cloud hosted versus cloud native argument that we don't need to get into here. But, but that's kind of the idea behind it is you're not really maybe uh, taking advantage of all the benefits of the cloud if you're not actually using microservices or scaling you know, or fully software as a service. Uh, it, it does give you the operability of having something on-prem and in the cloud in a hybrid model. And, and a lot of these folks, like I know Inito Proget and folks, will help you actually set up your mirrors between uh, uh, different repositories, which is great. Um, JFrog Artifactory is a really robust offering. They offer pretty much everything in the sun, under the sun in terms of artifacts. But a lot of the folks that I've worked with in previous companies, um, when, when um, we helped them with JFrog Artifactory uh, repositories, generally what we found is a lot of folks in the Artifactory space, they, those organizations have a dedicated Artifactory admin in-house. They have somebody managing that surface constantly because you do need a team or a person to um, manage it well and be able to scale it and spin it up as needed or authentication specifically for an, access to the different repos. So I'll quickly touch on NuGet v3 here, just these three uh, four options. So GitHub packages, GitLab package registry, AWS code artifact, uh, and finally Baguette. So the first three are, you know, um, sort of you already know those companies out there, GitHub, GitLab, AWS. Um, they offer NuGet v3 feeds. You know, eventually when we get there, um, then those will be available for you as well. Um, Baguette is a open source uh, project uh, by Loic Sharma from Microsoft. A very cool project, you can check that out. We've had an issue in there for NuGet v2 support, I think, back in the chocolate days. I don't know if that's gonna happen, to be honest. A lot of folks are just supporting NuGet v3 and hoping that the formats come up to meet it. So, let's talk about what, in my humble opinion, is the simplest approach. Now, this slide was, is, full disclosure, this slide is a marketing slide. So I could get into the, how CloudSmith is a global, cloud-native, secure, universal package management solution how we have 225 points of presence where your code is automatically available, your packages are available there for free, uh, and how we're secure and universal. But you know what, I'm not the marketing team and you're my people, so we're gonna skip this. Uh, and we'll go straight into sort of the idea behind this brass tacks behind the solution. So what I'm saying is, what I'm proposing is, um, it's, it's a frictionless sign up. So you literally go to cloudsmith.com. I challenge you to take more than three minutes signing up to, uh, and creating a repository. If you're using single sign-on like Azure, or um, a Microsoft account or a Google account or an AWS account. It's gonna be even quicker than that. Um, you get your trial account, which has all of the features of the, of the production service or the, the paid service uh, completely free for 14 days. And then it downgrades to the free, free account. Uh, but there's no credit card you need to plug in in that whole process. You don't need to pay anything. And the free, serve, free tier will give you ongoing for life uh, 500 megs of storage and a gig of egress bandwidth, we don't charge for ingress. And if you're an OSS contributor and you have your OSS modules that you wanna publish in a repo, as long as we can get to your GitHub repository and verify your license, we will give you 50 plus gigabytes of storage and 200 plus gigs of uh, bandwidth. Uh, and I say plus for both of those because we've worked with plenty of projects now, not just for NuGet, but we support 28 plus other formats like Docker, like NPM, like Java Maven and PyPy. And so for those open source projects, Often they have many versions and many formats available to, to communities and they've gone way over their storage, but we love to support the open source community. So please feel free to use that and there. That does mean plus. So we'll definitely expand as you go. So I encourage you to just create an account, create an org and a repo. It takes a, just a few minutes. In fact, I'll demo it for you in a second. Uh, and you can upload your own modules. Uh, you can test your installs globally. So if you have teams in different places, you can see how quickly our package delivery network gets those packages to them. And uh, you can upload other formats in the same repository. So this is unique to CloudSmith. I haven't seen this anywhere else. Um, we offer multi-format repositories. So not only can you store your PowerShell NuGet packages up there, you can store your Docker containers up there. You can store your Maven packages up there. You can store your NPM packages, your Helm charts. And every native um, tool that connects with them, like a, like a Docker command or a, a Choco command or any of the different commands for the different formats, 
we speak that language. So it presents like a metadata feed for that individual format. So the Docker list command is only going to show you the Docker containers there, even though there's NuGet packages in that repository. But when you run a find module against it, you're only going to see um, the PowerShell specific modules that are available. And of course, I would say, um, you know, the most important thing is submit feedback to help us improve because obviously we are an open source. We started an open source, but we are, we are a, um, a startup and uh, we just got past our Series A. But, you know, we f firmly believe that the uh, repository space is a space for a lot of growth. I mean, people want this to be simple and easy and frictionless. And I think there's a long time when, we, you know, that meme comes out where you're like, there's got to be a better way. You know, it's got to be an easier way to do this. So this is really where, what I feel here. And so I'm just throwing this up here just as a little bit of a, a troll for Josh, but like appreciation. Because as I was writing this talk, Josh, who's the creator of the Burnt Toast module, also a fellow colleague at, uh, previous colleague at uh, Chocolatey, um, he did mention this, that he actually did run this uh, against Nexus in our factory and had an issue. And so I did want to put it up here because he did spin up a CloudSmith trial on my suggestion and it all just worked flawlessly. So yeah, I'm going to use it because it was while I was doing my talk prep and I'm like, yep, sounds good to me. So let's, let's I'm going to show you a demo here and uh, we'll get into this. So I'm going to create a NuGet repository on CloudSmith live. So we'll hopefully have sacrificed enough goats to the demo gods and this will go well. Uh, but if not, we'll have a fun story to talk about. All right, so let me go over here. And I think I can just move this, can I? Oh, nice. Oh, that is problematic because then I can't see it. Hold on. Let me mirror my displays. Okay, awesome. Can you guys see that okay? Cool, great. Okay, so this is my Adil's demo Gmail account. I'm gonna use this to log in here using the single sign-on. You can by all means create your own. And so it just, just logged me in because the credentials are there. There's Adil's demo. I'm going to agree to the terms of service. You don't have to subscribe for the newsletter, but you can, it's nice too. Um, you'll, you'll know what's going on with us. So there you go, I've created my account, simple. Now I just need to create an org and a repository. So how simple is that to do? Let's create the organization right now. Let's call it Adil's demo. And let's give us the minimum storage requirements and bandwidth, that's fine. So basically this is spinning up my trial now. Of, so my goals are to centralize package management, sure. Uh, anything else you can help with me? No, I'm in a demo, please give me this now. Uh, I'm not a robot, confirming. Checking the boxes, clicking here. So that's my org. I basically set up my organization this is very much similar to the GitHub model, if you're familiar with that. So GitHub you know, has orgs and repos underneath the orgs. So there's my org setup. Now if I click on this org, you can see um, down here I can follow the repositories to see if there's any repository. Currently there aren't any. Let's, let's create one. So I'm doing this live. This is not like there's no peek behind the curtain, folks. This, you can do this right now on your laptop. So let's call this PS demo and spell that right too, just for fun. Uh, let's give it a default region of, you can pick wherever you want here, uh, but I'm going to say Oregon because it's probably the closest to here. Uh, we'll make this a public repository because that makes it a lot easier to set up. Now you can create a private repo for your organization. What you'll find is then you do need to send a credential uh, as a part of your authentication to that repo. So every time you run a find module or install module, you're going to have to add that credential per parameter to each of those. So just keep that in mind. Uh, in the code that I'll show you in a second, I show that off a little bit too. So there you go. There's my PS demo repository. Is this a NuGet repository? Well, really, it's an anything repository, so you can host whatever you like in it. There's a lot of settings here we can get into, but I'm going to skip over because I feel like we can get right into the code. Let me make these pretty. There you go. So we're just going to, uh, okay, let's take a look. So, so nice and easy. If you want to set yourself up, you click the set me up button. It actually points you to for your specific format some nice setup here. This is the NuGet CLI way you do this. There's a chocolatey way to do this as well, as well as PowerShell. So it's all just right there. So there's your credentials and stuff like that. So I know it's a Dill's demo and PS demo is my URL. So I've kind of pre-populated some of this stuff. So a Dill's demo and PS demo is good. Now the one thing I will need, because I'm working against this, because I will publish modules to here, is I do need an API key to be able to upload modules to here. So I'm just going to go over here for NuGet. And uh, just go to the documentation and pull up the API key. 
here we go. Uh, sorry, I should probably go in here, sorry, and pull up my API key. Now, this API key, of course, I will change it after this. This is a throwaway account, um, but uh, you can copy that here. Um, you can save this in your own secret management store. If you're using something like secret management, you can save this in your own secret default. I'm currently just um, sort of shoehorning this in. I'm creating it as a PowerShell profile environment variable so that I can use it again. So I will exit out of here real quick. I'll double check, yeah, 7B is the end of that. Let's make sure that that's my environment variable as I've defined it. CloudSmith, there we go. Yep, cool, awesome. All right, don't do that in prod. Like, you know, don't <laughs> just show people your API key and just use it. I'm just using it for the demo. So let's just do a get PS repository first to show you that I have no repository set up here. Helps if I actually type the rest of the command. There you go, so the PS gallery is there and it's untrusted. That's the standard you get on a Windows box. So let's go up here and clear the screen and I'm gonna just create my repository here real quick, or repository source URL, and my key. I'll define that up here. Yeah, good. And now I'm going to just download and save a couple of modules. I'm using invoke command as and PS Windows update as my examples. So let's go ahead and do that. Now we're hitting the PowerShell gallery to pull these down. Um, so just hold on to your seats. Perfect, that was pretty fast. Good job, PowerShell gallery. Um, I'll list here to show you I have invoke command as and PS Windows updates. I also have DBA tools because I love that project. Um, and uh, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna so those are just folders of the modules locally. I haven't actually installed them. So we'll go in here and we'll unregister the PS repository uh, for PS gallery. And I'll just get PS repository to show you I don't have a repository here now defined. So this is the same commands you saw over here in the web console when I clicked set me up. Um, it, it actually gave you these commands to register a package source and to register a, um, um, a PS repository. I'm just, all I've done here is I've splatted these, right? Because um, you want to splat a lot of these things in a hash table. It makes it a lot easier to read um, over here. Um, you can check out uh, about underscore splatting and help uh, if you want to check that out. So I'll just click on this here. Oh, hopefully that worked. Yep, there's my package source. There's my repository. Cool. So now if I do a get PS repository, need to type more. There you go. PS demo is in there and it's trusted. It's my nuget.cloudsmith repository. Good to go. So now I'm just going to just get my child items to list all the patent nuget, uh, sorry, modules that I have in this folder and just push them up and publish them to my repository. That's fine, I can ignore that. And I think that's specifically a warning for DBA tools because it's a big one. But uh, we'll go ahead and let that do its thing uh, to upload to CloudSmith. So I'll go over here to my repository and we'll refresh here. No packages yet. Let's wait and see. Ah, I think it is DBA tools that's going first. Sorry, I think I right clicked in it, put the code in there. That's okay, we'll just ignore that. Again, I'm doing this live, so you never know if it could fail. Ah, oh, there you go. So DBA tools was the first one. So it's a bigger module, so that's why it took a little bit longer to get up there. So you can see it's, it's up there now. Um, I will make sure, that, oh yeah, it took 44 seconds, so cool. So I'll clear the screen here and we can see in our repository, we've just pushed up those modules there. So invoke command as DBA tools, please Windows. Simple as that, you got your modules up there. Um, then of course, um, you can list them to make sure that they're actually against this PS demo repository. So I'm just finding uh, the modules that are here. So specifically for that repo name. Uh, and now I will install these modules, both of those two that I put up there. Let's see if this works. Ah, okay, so it's, it's so here's an important point to note. So initial on initial push to a CloudSmith repository, um, you see these little spinning boxes? Um, so it will go through a sync process where it syncs your module. So what it's doing here in the, new, the NuGet package is it's making it available um, universally for us on our platform. So that's 225 points of presence internationally. So around the globe. So you, in that process, initially, it can take a little bit of time to sync when you first push a module up there. Um, so I'm not gonna rush that um, over here. Uh, we will look at, let me just refresh this again to see how long it takes. I probably shouldn't have pushed DBA tools. Okay, there you go. They're all, they're all up there and they're synced now. That looks good. So I'm gonna go back to this code um, and we'll install PS Windows update and install. And the other ones already seem installed. So I'm just gonna do a get module 
list available. And you can see, yep, I have invoke command as posh git ps windows update. So I also have burnt toast locally. Let me see if I can uninstall this module because I want to show something off here. Let's see, well, how am I doing for time, folks? We're good? We're close? Okay, let me run into this quickly. So uninstall uh, module and we'll go burnt toast. Cool, okay, it's gone. And now I'm just gonna set the PowerShell gallery as my upstream. So you can define upstreams here, which is great, because then these upstreams actually um, will let you cache the module locally and serve it out from your repository. So, oh, sorry, not that. Let's call this PS gallery. And we'll give it the URL that we want. So if this is a NuGet upstream that um, we recognize, then we've already indexed it. And so this shows up in the green um, uh, lockbox there. So that means it's good to go. So the PS gallery is up there. Now, if I start um, doing a find module uh, against this, I'm gonna start getting the entire PS gallery, just like that, because I set it up as an upstream. But I'm not gonna do that right now. I'll just do the uh, individual burnt toast module and see if that comes up. So there you go. I didn't have burnt toast in my repository, but it is installing burnt toast now. And that's pulling from the PowerShell gallery as my upstream in the little, in the few seconds that I just did that. So super cool. So there you go. That is my demo of that piece of functionality. So we do have, a, I'm unconscious of time. Do we have four minutes left? Is it, is, is it five? Is the heart out? Okay, perfect. So yeah, I was going to highlight a couple more projects out here, but I'm going to open it up for, for discussion and questions if you guys have them, um, in case you want to bring some. Mike, you had a question? Oh, yeah, yeah, so we could have just done an install verbose and you would see that it's coming from CloudSmith specifically. So also the other thing, the great thing about that, Mike, is good point. So sorry, Mike brought up the question of, hey, can we actually examine that you, there's nothing up your sleeve, like you actually did install that from the PowerShell gallery. So the great thing about that is um, that upstream that was set up, right, that was cached here. Eventually in about 15 minutes, we have the eventual consistency there. So in the client logs and your statistics, it will, you can actually set up webhooks that will show you that where the package came from. Not only that, but that package will get cached as a package in this repository in about 15 minutes. It will show up in here as well. Yes. Yeah, no, good point. So, so if, it, if you have a newer version on your upstream, will it pull um, that newer version from the upstream or will it pull the one from your repository? It will actually pull the newer one from the upstream because it treats it all like one repository. Essentially, you have access to all of PowerShell gallery and your internal repo with that. This is really good for dev repository use cases because you, know, you don't necessarily want to expose your prod workflows to all of PS Gallery. Sometimes you want to curate that a bit. So you know, in your dev thing, if the devs are hitting against a dev feed for a repository, then you can just set PS Gallery as your upstream there, and it's nice and easy. So we probably don't have time here because only a few minutes, but you would eventually see the burnt toast module show up here. So not only does it get proxied, but it gets cached in your local repository. That is a feature request. So good question. Um, so can you restrict the modules that are available from an upstream? Yes, we do have something up on our product board for that specific use case. Um, it's often an ask of ours, and it is something we plan to work on in this year. Um, so thank you for that. But that, that, is, that is an important point to note. You, can, you, need, you want to be able to control what people can, can access. I will mention that our platform has entitlements as, as a feature of it as well, entitlement tokens, essentially. And entitlement tokens can get really granular. So you can say, I want to, like basically you give the entitlement token to a specific user. That user then you can, you can see when they log in and they, they actually pull down packages. But not only that, you can control that with any sort of regex you want. Only certain versions, only certain types of packages, only certain places. So you could very much give certain teams, let's say, like the finance team, only access to certain packages that they can install from there by giving them a custom entitlement token. For that. And again, the amount of users uh, that you can set up and entitlement tokens is infinite, regardless of what size of user you are, even free. So good question, thank you for that. So we have a minute left, right on the, I don't wanna keep you guys too long, folks. But um, if there are any other questions, I just wanna say real quick at the end here, uh, thank you for having me, first of all. 
And uh, I'm happy to stick around for more questions, but uh, you know, feel free to reach out to me in the halls or anywhere like that. Um, the one thing I'll mention quickly, I'm at five, but I will say this if I have time. One of the things that CloudSmith is planning to do um, that I'm working on internally with our team is um, we've already talked to the PowerShell team to see if there's a possibility to host a, um, a failover mirror for the PowerShell gallery. So the top thousand or so packages that are up from the PowerShell gallery, we would host a mirror of that called PS Mirror. And basically you can put that conditionally in your pipelines to say, hey, you know, um, whenever it will switch on when the PowerShell gallery is not available and switch off when the, or switch to private when the PowerShell gallery is available. So you could have very much a, like a conditional if or a try catch statement in your pipelines to say, hey, if PowerShell gallery isn't up, hey, just use PS Mirror instead. Just set up that repository locally. So um, I think it's a really cool idea. You know, I want to give back to the community because it gave me so much. So I'm making an internal push for this. So I love your feedback. If you like the idea, you know, feel free to reach out to me and bug me at some point, And we'll have a forum up somewhere where you can vote eventually. With that, thank you for your time. <laughs>